Hello everyone, welcome back to Mineral Live. I'm Kevin Hardy and with me is Armin von... Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Fontanovsky. Uh, yeah, he doesn't even know how to say it, never to the family, sure. so. Um, but, uh, and I had the pleasure of introducing him. I didn't get a chance to introduce my adopted child of Jordan, Walker Lee, but I do have the, the pleasure to introduce Armin. So uh, Armin came to Monroe, it's almost a year ago now, roughly in December. Um, went through essentially some of the basic clean design training that we did, we have and offer here, and essentially was immediately thrown into one of our high profile OEM um, clients projects, doing um, cost and weight reduction. So typically in, in general, we do a lot of these workshops. Cost is always a big factor. We do a lot of ideation to kind of get cost out of these vehicles that don't impact the customer per se, uh, to increase the overall bottom line of a vehicle and reduce its bomb price. Um, or just the overall platform price as well. And then oftentimes when we do a lot of these, these efforts, weight kind of comes with it, as you know. And one of the reasons we're, we're able to do some of these hoist reviews is essentially just the, the, the kind of, I guess you said, the presence that we have in the, the automotive market, just the, I guess, manufacturing uh, market in general. Um, but we have the brand new i7. So this is probably the first seven series I've seen in a long time. The last one that we had the chance to take a look at in any depth uh, is when they essentially brought a lot of the carbon fiber into the body structure after making a lot of those acquisitions in the supply chain. Um, though I don't believe this particular vehicle has much carbon, it's mostly aluminum and steel. So is, we haven't torn it down, so there's not a lot of information online whether this is similar to the IXM or IX right. vehicle, which is technically on the same CLAR cluster architecture. So if we get to tear this down at one point, um, Later in time, we'll see, but for example, IX has a lot of different types of carbon fiber, some multi-material architecture, so it uses steel, aluminum, basically everything there is in the automotive yep. world, optimizing what material is best for what application. We suspect this is the case here, but from our vantage point, from underneath the car, it's rather difficult to see, but um, yeah, let's just work our way back and maybe we get a glimpse at, at the Klar. Um, underlying yeah. uh, chassis system. And unfortunately, probably the only view you have of this is, is probably right through here, Eric, if you want to come around and let me get the, uh, the laser pointer. But you can see a little bit of the front end, which oftentimes we call the FESM or front end structural module. Um, you can see here, this is mostly aluminum. And uh, as kind of Armin alluded to, we can see some MIG welding operations. So some one, one, uh, one sided welding operations here. They're obviously bolting the uh, crush can and the front uh, bumper impact beam assembly to the aluminum. It looks like it's probably an extrusion. I don't see any flanges from here, um, but an extruded aluminum rail itself. There's spot welds through here. There's some rib nuts going into this. So um, a host of manufacturing and fastening strategies being used already in that very, very small aspect of the body structure that we can see itself. And then as we kind of Look forward, maybe from this particular angle, if you can, uh, Eric. You'll see this, the sorb tusk here. So this large forged aluminum uh, tusk that comes out past the 25% you know, threshold of the vehicle, uh, overall width itself, reaches the front part of the cradle, cradle excuse me, and then starts reaching back and complementing the, the cast cradle itself. And then there's a stamped aluminum shear plate that runs across the cradle assembly yeah. itself. Yeah. And it's kind of notable to call this out as a, as a forged aluminum uh, tusk. Usually we'd see these um, manufactured from a steel or maybe an extruded aluminum. Never really cast because you need these, uh, the material properties of forging in terms of irrigation, crash absorption. If this was cast, likely this might just break off and not um, support its, its intended function. So um, have you seen these? Forged often? I, so, kind of yeah, on the one of our very first teardowns, at least when I was here at Monroe, the I3, a different execution. So they had a forged, if I remember, tusk off of the, essentially the front um, like tension link mount here to split and try and get the uh, suspension to roll out of the wheel well. Okay. Um, it is interesting to note, and we can kind of maybe look a little bit in here and as far as the frontal structure and what you can see, very linear load fast and Load pass and very traditional, uh, if I might, I might add. Um, not a lot of reinforcement of this area, aside from the very large forging here, because I think you know BMW is managing a lot of the energy here, and they're not building up a lot of the the weight forward of this portion of the vehicle, which is kind of nice. I've I've talked a lot about the Hyundai Kias and how they balance some of their weight strategy for Sorb, but you can tell how heavy 
this vehicle is, I want to say it comes in about, what, 4,900 plus pounds? Something like that, yeah. But when you look at this extrusion, how they cut off there, it's oftentimes we'll see, I don't know, three and a half to five millimeters. That's probably every bit of five to seven through here. It's very thick. And unfortunately, you know, mass begets mass. Even though they're, they're using aluminum, they still have to stop the weight with this vehicle mm -hmm. um, in various impact scenarios. Yeah. But as we kind of move rearward and we see that the suspension itself, um, I would say very traditional for a BMW. We're seeing yeah. lots of forged aluminum, lots virtual ball, SLA set up. Um, we're not gonna talk too much about ride and drive or anything like that. Jordan did drive this for a couple of days. Uh, he used to have a 550i uh, BMW way back in the day, I believe an mm -hmm. F10. Um, much like that vehicle, you know, impeccable driving dynamics, no tire clap, the noise is very well managed. Uh, I think for the price tag that you're, you're paying for this vehicle, you know, well north of $120,000, um, you're kind of getting in that, in that regard, you're getting a lot of value from it, of being kind of like a luxury mm -hmm. saloon, you yeah. know. Uh, did you want to say anything about that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, maybe this isn't the um, uh, driving perfection that BMWs used to stand for, but from a comfort perspective, right, and overall dynamics, you know, just similar to Jordan's BMW, you have the virtual ball, which lets you put your uh, pivot point outside the spindle, right? So you have much more control over dynamics and how you uh, control camber through the articulation of the suspension, toe, etc. So this is one enabler to get in that, um, that uh, compliance uh, coupled with the uh, dynamics that uh, Jordan will talk to. But yeah, you, it's... Very typical BMW. You just see forged elements everywhere, yep. and, and air suspension as well, right? And um, if um, we believe that the air suspension is controlled per per corner, so that would allow for um, if you look at this component up here, that would allow for basically corner balancing the car on the fly, depending on how it's loaded, etc., and load leveling. So um, adds in a lot of cost, but does pay off in terms of adjustability and tunability. And again, we can't see too much because of the shear plate here that's installed, but what we can see is, is very typical in a lot of high, um, like high dollar, low volume applications. And just in general, when you're kind of seeing these aluminum cradles, so cast aluminum ends with aluminum extrusions running across and they're being welded in place. Very, very common. You know, Getting essentially a castings wall thickness as thin as an extrusion to run cross car is, is difficult, depending on how much material you're pushing through here. And the big thing, obviously, with Tesla and their Giga Presses is when you do little corner nodes like this, it keeps your press tonnage uh, significantly lower. So there's a lot of cost with that cell. And then just the, uh, the availability of, of tooling in your area for the vehicle, it opens up some more things. You know, when you start getting these Giga Presses, there's only so many suppliers that can build that, that tool. And, um, only so many options of where you can manufacture yeah. something like that. And this is the typical, you know, a, a balancing act that um, we can offer to our customers, right? Like it's having smaller tonnages, but then two different castings versus uh, a larger casting that incorporates all of this that might have slightly different performance, but the same structural function. And then you would have to weigh that against uh, you know, uh, manufacturing uh, count. And so this is where our internal systems come in, right? Where, yeah. Where this is basically what we do all day. Should you do this or should you do an integrated casting? And then it, the discussion becomes what else can you incorporate, right? Sure. So it's, it's a high level holistic view of the system. And we've talked about it a few times, like the, the activity based costing, and that's kind of where we base a lot of our costing efforts in, and, you know, how many people theoretically touch this, you know, and depending on how much information we have or whatever assumptions we make and given feedback from the client, you know, we can, we can start tuning some of that to be more in line with where an idea we may generate would be brought into the light as far as, or maybe actually see manufacturing feasibility and kind of tune some of those numbers and, and see if it's worth putting significant amount of engineering resources to run that to ground mm -hmm. from there. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about? No, I'm just pointing out the moving? AGS system here. That's um, active grill shutters, right? So these can open up uh, depending on cooling need and keep them closed for aerodynamics when you don't need it. Um, so this would be, one of the systems that enable uh, or that would maximize, maximize range on uh, a BEV like this. So I think this is over 300 miles at about 101 kilowatt hours usable. So the battery is a little bit larger, 
just to keep it um, from degrading, you give the customer a little bit of a, sure. a tolerance there, a little bit of a buffer. And one of the things that's interesting is, you know, this is also an ICE vehicle as well. Yes. So they're balancing essentially, um, I wouldn't necessarily call this like, this uh, like uh, class A or forward facing AGS per se, um, but there is kind of a mixture. This, the lower AGS system here is definitely you know, behind the front fascia within its own sub-assembly behind mm -hmm. it. And then this is part of the overall fascia yeah. assembly. We're seeing a big trend towards some of these more fascia uh, specific um, AGS systems if needed on BEVs as they essentially mm -hmm. try to really capitalize on, I guess it's just the different styling elements that you're able to execute with a BEV specifically and really take advantage of some of the manufacturing yep. efficiency yep. of that style. So. And as you mentioned, this is also an ICE vehicle. so. Um, from a structural perspective, there's going to be some trade-offs, right? If you design a platform that has to accommodate ice as well as battery electric, um, you are, both of them will sure. be, you know, have to accommodate the other. Right. For instance, you have this big battery, a lot of structure. If you, you can't see it here, but it has these large extrusions that inherently has a lot of structure. But we can't really leverage the structure in this vehicle likely because you don't have that in the ICE version. So the ICE version really defines how much chassis you have in that car structure. And then the pack will add structure just because it's bolted in with so many fasteners, but it's not really needed, right? So if you design it just BEV or just ICE, likely it would be lighter and less costly in any case. But overall, for a business case, from BMW's perspective, they needed to leverage Yes. Platform for both. And that's something like with our customers that we're always balancing, you know, like you can you can go in this BEV specific range, tailor everything here, and they're like, well, we buy a you know a coolant pump into hundreds of thousands, right? You know, and we're getting really good pricing on that. And it does make some of these more integrated solutions tough to sell because of essentially some of these piece price advantages that you have when you're leveraging volume across your entire um, fleet of vehicles. So uh, we're underneath the battery pack itself, not a ton to see here. So these are extrusions. You can kind of see some of the cells and some of the relief cuts they do here. This might be for impact to get something to crush or yield in the, the manner in which they prefer. Maybe some, yeah, initiation. Um, you can see here though, running across the vehicle, it looks like a friction stir weld to probably tie in either castings or extrusions that are running cross car within the battery itself. One thing that's kind of interesting is you, hear, you see a, and BMW does like to use vision systems. There's a whole target for the center of the battery pack itself um, mm -hmm. that's visible. And then over here where you see the starts of the friction stir welds, it looks like they're coming back in for the, the initiation of that, um, that assembly operation and plugging any holes or gaps yeah. that they might see. Um, whether it's a manual operation or not, it's kind of interesting to see. I don't, I don't see that too often. And then where they finish up the, the, uh, the potential friction stir weld, they're cleaning it up on the, yep. the driver's side itself. It's true, you don't see that too often, right? And then, yeah, typical friction stir weld. Here you see the marks of, of the tool head spinning around. I don't know if it shows up on camera, right? But the big deal with these types of welds are that, you, one, you have a much more controlled geometry. Like if you compare it to a MIG weld, let's say right over here, if you come with your camera, you see much more a much less defined geometry, right? So that would um, affect your stress distribution, right? Just this is much cleaner. So you have an advantage there from a structural perspective, as well as here, you put in much more heat into a material, right? You, you melt it, it's a fusion weld, you fuse the components together, basically annealing your temper out of the aluminum, losing uh, uh, properties, right? Whereas with this friction stir weld, you're uh, put much less temperature into your material, keeping the temper to uh, a larger extent. It's still affected, but um, you basically mechanically um, manipulating the material and stirring it into, um, into a, a few state, right? And um, so you do lose properties, but not nearly as much as in a fusion weld. And um, it's, it's a very neat, very neat, uh, also energy efficient uh, uh, fastening strategy. Uh, we see it a lot and it's actually very prevalent in some like more industrial applications to get essentially series of smaller like sheets of aluminum or aluminum extrusions and to join them together. A um, lot with just dis dissimilar thicknesses of materials. So you'll see a lot in steel of laser welded or tailor welded blanks being brought yeah. together. So um, 
I want to say, I think in like some of the high-end Lexus applications, we've seen you know dis dissimilar material thicknesses on some of their right. aluminum joints and being as, friction as weld. well as dissimilar materials. So you yeah. can weld um, steel and aluminum via friction stir welding together, which you cannot fuse, right? So because of intermetallic compounds that um, you create in, in the weld pool at, the, at those temperatures, so that you can do here. Not they haven't done it. We haven't seen. You don't even see it too much in, in automotive, but Principally, uh, something that sometimes we um, uh, recommend to our customers to integrate components, et cetera. So at the aft portion of the battery here, and you can see a little bit of the, the extrusions. Again, this is a very common strategy with, uh, with battery packs, especially first out of the gate. One thing I, I mean, from an aesthetic perspective and just the, the optimization that is done. So there is the extrusion and there's a small cast bracket node here. And uh, you know, obviously they have gone through a series of iterations to get it very lean and uh, it's kind of maintained like a cross shape like cross section coming through here as well which is it's aesthetically pleasing you know to the eye as well um, yeah. and then we have some again some more extrusions running across one thing that is kind of interesting it does look like it has some sort of composite SMC lid and on top of that it looks like I mean, we, when we can feel up on top you know, this like a it's like a perforated heat shield material. Oh, actually, I don't think it's perforated. Let me clean that up. It might be. I don't think so though. But this is sheet, this like heat shielding material is very common on exhaust heat shields, whether they're PIA or part and assembly on the actual exhaust itself or on the body side. Um, but it looks like the entire battery itself is covered in this. Something that we definitely don't typically see, and it yeah. might be due to some constraints from um, how the battery is packaged, and it might be. Um, a trade-off given the fact that it's also a ice platform yeah, as well. Yeah, it, it so. might very well stem from um, having to accommodate ice as well, right? And it looks like you're just trying to keep some of that heat from the battery to mm -hmm. you know, conduct the through, the, to the, um, through the floor pan into the compartment. Um, as we continue to move a little bit rearward, so you can see the cradle, the rear cradle here, much more exposed, very similar strategy. I think a different style casting um, for the each corner node here or side node with running extrusions again across. This vehicle is rear steer. Um, you can kind of see here with the, the overall steering rack assembly itself. Uh, very, very common in some of the higher end German vehicles like the, the Audi Q7 and things of that nature to have rear steering. It helps a lot with you know larger vehicles and tighter spaces on um, for parking and, and things like that. And just even lane transfer yeah. at high, higher speeds. It looks like there's this only supplies a very uh, small amount of steering yep. angle, right? If you look at this bellow here, and even the steering rod is just looks like a link at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so you, usually the racks are just smaller versions of what you see in the front. Correct. Right? Like, yep. But yeah, this looks like it's, uh, you know, you could almost oversee it. If you don't see this section, you just think it's a traditional multi-link rear. And then like just below the rear cradle, you know, you see this very large galvanized steel like weld mid assembly. So we have bent and flattened tubes. These are just, looks like roll tubes as well, you know, running through this. And this is structure that you, you often see in like convertibles, right? So vehicles that lose a good portion of their body structure, you'll end up with some sort of like under bracing like this to help bring some of that structure back. But this one is reaching out here from a, not only the battery itself, but where the torque box or the rear torque box on this vehicle would be where the rocker is joining to the rest of the rear uh, motor bay rails it's coming underneath the cradle itself it's this arm is reaching across doing like kind of a double shear bracket for the rear cradle itself so it's hard mounted to the body there's an isolator here a steel cup plate and it's helping to locate essentially this whole assembly and then when these arms are now reaching out to the body itself so again it's it's one thing that you know time and time again um you know that bmw does take driving dynamics you know pretty seriously and you can see the amount of um, effort that they put to essentially join these various monuments of the rear cradle and the body structure together and then branch them across as they as they um, reach out. And then here above your head we see the air tank for the air suspension and uh, this looks like it's the pump. Oh yeah, yeah isolated. isolated. Isolated pump to feed the tank and uh, it looks like this is the only tank we see so whether it's valved or whether you would have multiple tanks, looks like there are some provisions to mount, mount maybe another uh, tank for maybe a different trim level. But um, on Tesla, 
for other vehicles, we sometimes see these integrated with um, other cross-car components, right? So you have a tank, now it's just standalone, it just has one function, but um, essentially it's, it's a relatively robust component and you could uh, uh, integrate it, give it more structural, structural function by uh, tying shock toes together and have a hollow uh, um, shock toe brace, for example, or uh, cow support. Um, so these are, again, some, some of the things that we um, think about at Monroe. How can we take a component and make it um, function? Um, how can we give it more than just one function and co reduce cost that way? Yeah, and I'm trying to think uh, of the vehicles that we've seen with Air Ride. Typically speaking, I think still to this day, Tesla's probably the only one that's integrated into another component, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it really kind of comes down to, like, and these are conversations again that we have with a lot of our kind of our OEM customers is, you know, what the take rate is of this, how much is it worth to try and get yeah. some of the stuff into the, what, how much of a tear up it would be. Um, not everyone is in the same kind of financial situation um, as Tesla with respect to kind of spending money or the ability to quickly spend money. Like they, they are very, it's very evident for both their actions and even when you talk to various suppliers that deal with them that they, they move extremely fast. Um, that's a whole other realm of kind of conversations as yeah. far as part revisions and how do you service vehicles like that. But it's, it's interesting to see that on maybe this particular vehicle and if this, this cradle would be bespoke to this particular uh, platform that, and, you, and you have a lot of volume or high take rate, could you not integrate that and get it into the rear casting? Yeah. But, uh, no, go ahead. While we're pointing in this corner, we also noticed that um, you know, in typical BMW fashion, you have a uh, two material um, uh, brake disc. So you have aluminum hat. You can kind of see it. We should have pulled the wheel off. You can kind of see it here. Made it to a um, steel disc, right? So this gives you a weight reduction. And um, actually, I haven't seen the manufacturer exactly like this. Usually you see that the manufacturer, the disc, and then overcast uh, the hat. Here it looks a little bit different. Um, looks like it might be riveted together, but again, it's, it's a weight buy. You try to reduce unsprung mass and um, you do add some manufacturing engineering complexity and cost therefore, but uh, here the trade-off was well worth it to them and try to make this the ultimate driving machine, yeah. I suppose. Um, I guess maybe coming back under the body itself, one thing that's interesting, and, and we see a, a host of different materials used, but within the, the rear impact beam itself, so a stamp steel weldment, and you can see the e-code in here, but it has its normal volume essentially uh, being created here. And then it also has like a, another hat section down at the bottom. And I'm not sure if I've ever seen that kind of executed that way before. Um, it's a simple way to essentially get more section without the weight, right? You know, the hat, hat sections are very common. Um, if you're going to do essentially kind of the C shape and when you splay out this, um, the size of the panel, you get a lot of rigidity there as well, but, um, it's interesting. And, uh, I would argue it's a, a weight conscious scenario with using steel as a material and kind of to that point, when you look at some of these links here, like especially this lower link itself, steel, unlike a lot of the forgings and the, uh, that we see in the, in the front of the vehicle, but it is extremely efficient. And sometimes honestly, steel is the right right material. Yep. You're seeing kind of a comeback as steel has responded to some of the, the aluminum and other lightweight materials being infused into vehicles um, as to trying to bring back this essentially lightweight, high strength, low cost option. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes just in general, steel is the way to go. Uh, just, I can't, how efficient and lean this arm is. Yeah, it's, this is it's very impressive. It's a very so. nice component, right? You see, yeah, highly skeletized, optimized, right? And then BMW flanges in, in more material right here at the at the edge of the holes to um, just give more material to where you naturally see stress concentrations right at, at the radii of these uh, cutouts right and again also here this little flange all has function to put material where you need it from a stress distribution point of view right so yeah very very elegant steel execution of, yeah. of a link absolutely but uh. But yeah, I mean, when you kind of look at it overall, it's, um, it's kind of exactly what I would expect, you know, from a high-end BMW. Um, and it's, it's interesting for sure. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we um, kind of wrap it up? No, I wish we could see some more of the structure. But yes, yeah, yes. not much to see. But um, well, uh, thank you very much for joining us today, uh, for looking at the, 
the hoist review of the, the i7. Uh, we appreciate it. I appreciate getting a chance to kind of talk to you, you know, through this. Uh, again, you know, we, we try and do a lot of these to kind of bring some additional insight, uh, at least a, a little different perspective to automobiles and kind of how they're manufactured. Um, more than likely, we probably won't tear this down. We'll see. If there's a lot of interest from various <laughs> OEMs, maybe someone will, 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 yeah. will want to see it, but uh, more than likely, we probably won't, uh, which is unfortunate. They're, they're always cool and rewarding to kind of tear down. But, um, but yeah, I again, appreciate the time. Um, you. You know, we were able to do a lot of this stuff through, obviously, like the sales of our reports and things of that nature. So there is, I mean, we think there's a lot of value there, but um, there is a lot to be gained from some of them. And if there's anything that might interest you, because you know, cost is king, especially with EVs and getting essentially cost out with the with the, yep. with, the, with the price of batteries. You know, it's a very high line your, item. <laughs> your lithium yeah. raw material. Yeah. So again, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And uh, until next time. Thank you.